Thank you very much, Konstantinos. Um, so as uh, the very kind introduction went, my name is Anthony Kluck. I'm a senior account manager and uh, look after the Nordic region at Georgeson. Uh, I have been involved in a number of high profile uh, contested and non-contested special situations across Europe over the last few years. Um, to my right here is Giuseppe Domino from Amber Capital. I will let all of these people, fine esteemed gentlemen, uh, do their own introductions. But Amber, for many of you will know, is a, um, a, a, a prolific investor in Southern Europe and uh, is both uh, an activist and a, uh, a general investor in special situations. And um, we also have uh, Francesco Navarini from PERC, uh, and many of you will know PERC as an influential proxy advisor. They uh, advise uh, clients holding in excess of 1.5 trillion US dollars under management, uh, a very influential um, voice in the world of governance and how companies um, uh, carry out their business uh, every year. And then, of course, we have uh, one of Athens' favourite sons, Philip Bernardus, who's uh, come back from London to, um, to give us his views. Uh, Philip is uh, one part of the uh, asset stewardship team at State Street Global Advisors, who uh, at current levels look after around 2.8 trillion uh, of assets around the world. And Philip is uh, one of the integral parts of their, uh, their European governance team. Um, so, uh, I will let uh, each of the panel members um, give their own introductions and pass on their own views, but if I just maybe start with the first question to uh, Giuseppe, is that across Europe in general, we've seen actually a decline in the number of uh, companies that are subject to uh, public demand by activists. Uh, the numbers from the three-year average are down around 17% for 2019 uh, in the months that we've had already. And um, do you think that, broadly speaking, there's been a change in the style of activism? Has the focus <coughs> of activism changed? And um, has there been a, an approach uh, that you've seen that's been changing rapidly over the last few months, uh, and, and how has your investment horizon changed during that transition? Uh, first of all, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Giuseppe Limino. I'm the manager, uh, managing director of Amber Capital and based in London. Uh, I've been in industry uh, for more than 15 years, and I've been invested in Greece actually uh, since 2012, so I've been very familiar with your country. Uh, to answer your question, um, I think it's important to uh, remind ourselves that to get accurate data about the volume of activist campaigns in Europe, but not just in Europe, is, is not easy because what you see on media, what you read in the papers about shareholders' activism or campaigns or proxy fights, is just a very small portion of what we call shareholders' engagement with companies. And I think at least is, is, is our experience, what we've been doing for the last 20 years at Amber, is uh, we, we have been engaged with boards, we've been engaged with shareholders and other stakeholders, but what we see uh, in the public uh, arena is just a small portion of what we do. Most of our work is done behind the scenes, and this is, in our view, the best way to be uh, productive and achieve results for all shareholders. Uh, what we have noticed uh, in the last few years in Europe is uh, the level of engagement by shareholders has definitely increased and is still increasing. Uh, and in particular, the size of the target companies has increased. So you see more and more companies of, of a larger size uh, being, uh, being targeted by activists or engaged shareholders. Uh, in terms of uh, style, yes, I think you're right. Uh, over the last 10 years in Europe, the uh, style of shareholders, activism, engagement has, has changed significantly. If you go back 10 years, you probably remember that you know, a few cases of large US-based activist shareholder coming to Europe, uh, showing up on the shareholders register with large stakes, and apply the same rules and the same approach that you know, they, 
they, they applied in their own countries, uh, uh, hoping and expecting to achieve the same good results that they have achieved over the last 30 years in the US. Uh, but in our experience, in our view, I think this approach, one size fits all, doesn't work in Europe. And it doesn't work because uh, you need to take into account the peculiarities, the social and cultural differences of each country in Europe. Uh, you need to understand the, the local rules, you need to understand the personalities, you need to understand the, the different uh, cultural differences. Uh, and this is, in our spin, has been very, very important to achieve success uh, in our campaigns. Uh, and this is true for Greece. Uh, the same way has been true for Italy and Spain and Portugal, where we've been very active over the last few years. So that, that approach, in our view, doesn't work. That's why the style has slowly changing. And also, in our view, um, uh, if you look at our experience, we've been doing this for more than 20 years. Uh, we have been building relationships with a lot of these corporates uh, for a long time. You cannot show up on the shareholders register with a stake of two or three percent, start agitating the boards, making claims and proposals, and then walk away after a few months. Uh, our average uh, investment period is about four to five years. So we've been very engaged with management, with boards, uh, with regulators, with other shareholders, and has been the key of our success to make sure that we are perceived as trusted, responsible shareholder that try to improve value for, for everybody. And to go to your last point about investment horizons, this is very important, not just for activists per se, but it's, it's important for investing in general. Uh, I was uh, reading one statistic from the Harvard Business Review that says that the average holding period in the public markets is today about seven months, compared to five years back in the 70s. So even if you're not sure this activist, you know, seven months is not investing in our view. It's more a, a, a speculation, a gambling. And this is important because a lot of corporates claim that all these activists are speculators. They come, they, they, they agitate, they make claims, and then they walk away to make, you know, after they done, after they made a, a quick buck. It's definitely not okay, our case. Our capital is locked up for five years. So when we take a position, we, we are long-term shareholders, and we're very concentrated, and uh, this is very well perceived by corporates when we engage with them. So uh, investment horizon is very important, and you know, corporates uh, have, a, have a point when they complain that uh, some of the traditional activists, especially non-European activists, come and go uh, without actually making responsible and sound proposals. So Francesco, on that point, uh, have you found that in your engagement with companies that they are more willing and ready to accept failings and remedy those? And um, how do you think that companies are reacting to not just uh, investors pushing for change, but the general uh, corporate governance standards that are imposed on them? <coughs> Thank you. Uh, first of all, Talimera, thanks. Um, it's been an honor to be invited and it's a privilege. I feel it as a privilege to be here, so thanks very much. Um, let me just take a quick word about myself. I'm not very good at talking about myself, but um, I've been working for Perks since 2014. I'm currently heading research, meaning all the research and production for global markets, which in this case actually uh, well, includes Greece, of course, which is in the world. But, uh, and um, it also allows me to take a bit more of a broader overview about what you asked. So I think it's a very, I think we have a couple of good news here. One is, as I say, endogenous, and the other one um, uh, is external. So uh, I'll start from, from the last one. Engagement has become, um, so the quick answer is yes. Um, the engagement, and this is due to the fact that, well, on the external side, um, engagement has become, has started to enter also recommendations of corporate governance in the codes. Uh, the latest one, for example, is the UK Corporate Governance Codes, where now committee chairs are recommended to disclose how they have engaged with shareholders and investors on the issues of uh, of importance, of relevance for their committees. Um, and it's not just a statement saying we have engaged with the shareholders during the years, but it's actually a very qualified statement about we have recognized what, so we've listened to our shareholders, uh, we've, we've recognized what's not, what's a challenge, and we are working on this in the future. So this is a, it's an external factor, but it's actually an important one. Um, um, and internally, companies have been, we note that companies have been 
much more active uh, in responding to us in two ways. First of all, so in globally, the percentage of companies that respond to our reports, we send our reports to all companies. Um, for companies listed in the UK and in the FTSE Euro First, we send it before being published to our clients, but we also send it um, to every company uh, that we on which we issue reports. Um, and what we could see, and this applies to Greece as well, that in like two or three years ago, they would just respond to a to a report and say, "Can you just change this recommendation to a pause into a four? They just wanted us to change it, and that was it. And then we would never hear from them for another year. What happened in, in recent time, like in two, three years, that actually engaging off-season, companies are more willing to engage off-season, understanding the reason why we opposed, um, and then also asking, okay, what would be acceptable for you as a proposal? So why, what would be the scenario in which you would actually recommend the support for, uh, for this proposal in the future? So um, I think it's, it's, it's a change of, 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 of paradigm between expecting that you vote in favor or recommend in favor for all to actually understand the reason why you oppose and actually do something about it. Very good. Um, to that point about change and how companies are, are looking at their engagement, um, Philip, when you look at a company in your portfolio and as one of the world's largest index managers, uh, there's a slightly different way of looking at the world. Um, it's not seven months, as Giuseppe uh -huh. pointed out, it's essentially forever. Does that change how you address the company proposals? Does that change your view of how companies go about their business? Sure. Good morning, everyone. Calimera. Um, my name is Philip Venades. I'm uh, uh, vice president of uh, uh, the asset stewardship team of State Street Global Advisors. It's a real ple pleasure to be here today in, uh, in, in Athens, which is my hometown. Um, at State Street Global Advisors, and let me take a step back to explain a little bit about what we do. Uh, we are the world's uh, third largest uh, asset manager, uh, managing over $2.8 trillion in, in AUM. Um, what we do as, uh, as an index manager, essentially we are, let's say, semi-permanent to permanent capital. So unlike an active fund, we don't have uh, the ability to sell. Uh, in a company so long as it is in the index. So it is a little bit like, um, think about it like, you know, being in a marriage where divorce is not an option. So um, you need to engage with your investing companies. You need to sit down with your partner and engage. So engagement, it's, uh, it's very important for us. And this is what we do as, uh, as an investor. So uh, we use our voice and, and vote in order to, um, to improve corporate governance and, and ESG, I would say, environmental, social and governance factors in our investing companies. Um, so engagement is very important. How we do this, the approach we take, we use engagement as a tool. So we kind of use what we call a carrot and a stick approach. Not literally, I mean, I, I, we don't work with a stick around, but what we mean is uh, um, the, the, the carrot is the engagement and if that doesn't work, then we use a stick which is a vote. Um, now, in terms of the, at, at, the, at the global level, I guess, like, you know, governance, I should say, it's very, like, uh, uh, market, market specific and more sector agnostic. Uh, the opposite, I would say, with, like, you know, the environmental issues, which are, are more, like, sector specific, market agnostic. So that means that, uh, well, uh, when we engage with companies, we see different standards. So, uh, um, so for example, like, you know, UK companies are more mature when it comes to engagement and uh, they will usually like offer like uh, board directors. We will engage with, uh, and we like to engage like with decision makers. So we're going to engage with like the board of, uh, of directors and, uh, and at C CEO, CFO level. And when it comes to other markets, such as Greece, for example, even though like, you know, there, there have been several positive steps in, in terms of uh, uh, the Greek corporate governance that we see, uh, we think that there's still like, you know, room for like strengthening, let's say, the, uh, uh, the engagement programs uh, uh, in Greece. Back to Giuseppe, um, and, and on that point about 
the quality and standards of, uh, of boards and in things like independence and board composition. Do you think that companies are more attuned to this when you engage with them and show them the problems that exist? Are they willing to accept their failings? Are they willing to address them more? Uh, the, the activist playbook was always um, squeeze as much juice out of the orange as you could. Is, have things changed in the sense that it's not just about the, um, the financial returns that one can generate in the short term, but rather building a, a more sustainable and a more viable company over the long term by implementing higher standards of governance? Is this a, a conversation that's more common these days with, with you? Yeah, I think uh, it, it depends. It depends on the country, it depends on the specific situation you're dealing with. I, in general, our experience is that uh, the corporate governance issues is still very uh, important is probably more important than uh, proposals that refers more to capital uh, capital structure or strategic decisions. So corporates and shareholders are still more keen on corporate governance, uh, and and this is uh, this is even more true when you think about the traditional institutional investors. They become increasingly more sensitive to corporate governance. Uh, also because, you know, as you know, the European uh, uh, Shareholders' Right Directive he has already introduced the, uh, the corporate governance uh, concerns as one of the core element of traditional institutional investors' uh, fiduciary duty. So they are more sensitive to these topics, and that's why when we go and propose uh, improvements to corporate governance uh, to the companies we invest in, uh, we receive more and more support from traditional institutional investors. Uh, in our experience, in our view, corporate governance is, is key to assure that the board, the management, uh, manage the company uh, in an effective way for the uh, interests of all shareholders. And without good corporate governance practices, uh, it's very often that you know, these lead to a, an effective uh, capital allocation or uh, ineffective uh, management decisions in our view. So having a good sound corporate governance I think is extremely important because this leads to um, other um, decisions uh, which are very important to create value. Uh, and actually what we've seen over the last 18, 24 months is that the traditional institutional investors are becoming themselves, as we heard, uh, more activists themselves and more engaged in, in these kind of topics. And this is very welcome to us because, you know, finally it's another actor, very important actor uh, to push corporates to, to, to hear the concerns the shareholders have in terms of corporate governance. Uh, so to answer your question, I think, you know, in our experience, obviously depends on the country, but in our experience, the corporates are much more sensitive. Uh, in countries like Italy or Spain, a lot of progress has been made over the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And actually minority shareholders have a lot of tools at their disposal to be heard and to have representation on the board, and this is very welcome. In other countries, uh, still a lot of work needs to be done, uh, but we are optimistic that over time uh, we will go in that direction and the corporates in each European country will follow the international best standards. Francesco, as a proxy advisor, has your role changed? Have your clients uh, changed in uh, the demands they make of you? Um, do you have to devote more resources, provide deeper analysis, um, really get into the weeds on contested situations? Um, when an activist comes to a company, is, is there a a really thorough process that you go through to try and determine who's who's really acting in the long-term interests of shareholders? Well, <coughs> it's not an easy question, so thanks for asking. Um, well, let me, let me take a step back. So, um, first of all, I don't know if you know, but Burke has always been called like the canard in the coal mine when it comes to corporate governance. We always uh, try to flag out what other competitors or other proxy advisors would not. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call ourselves more radical than others, but it, it is true that historically Burke has sometimes flagged up situations that then turned out to be correct. Um, so 
this, this, of course, together with a uh, with with um, with a framework where proxy research advisors are becoming more influential. Uh, the share structure is changing in Europe. In UK, it already was already very very fluid, uh, but in continental Europe, is becoming uh, less controlled. The controlled ownership is becoming less uh, less so. Uh, and so, of course, the, the, influen the influence uh, can be exercised by our clients via our recommendations is increasing. So in all of this framework, um, I think we, we, this, we, we, we couldn't give a good response without looking at the role that's played by social media and the new <laughs> technological information revolution. Um, it, it, it's very easy now to actually, it's more easy now or, um, to paradoxically to be more objective in, in our recommendations. So of course, uh, regardless of the, the, the breakthrough of a campaign or the magnitude of the campaign, we're always trying to stick to facts and we're always trying to look at what's best in shareholders' interests. So the fact that, let's say, a, a, a campaign is repeated virally doesn't make it true. It doesn't make it in shareholders' best interests. Um, but it does, it does, it has two positive um, immediate consequences. First of all, Companies must engage. So companies have historically taken up the challenge and actually engaged in public arena. Um, and the second consequence, which is a consequence for us, is that it allows, it allows us to understand, or it helps us understand, what's the story behind the information or behind the, the whole of these data that seem to come without, without a structure. So uh, all these media campaigns, you can get more of an understanding of what's the investor agenda, so the story behind it, and why, you know, then what's the investor's agenda? There are some investors at campaigns that have been extremely viral, but they just acted out of personal interest because maybe uh, a shareholder did not like a special director for something that they've, they've been arguing about in the past or, or for something for a very specific decision or a very specific investment. Of course, you cannot allow that. I mean, you have to look into the, uh, into the just, just for that reason. Of course, uh, you have to look at the best, at the best um, shareholder's interest in the long term. And of course, media paradoxically actually allows by triggering engagement from the company, it also allows a better understanding of the whole agenda, so we're getting a best picture. And so we, it helps us align with, uh, with shareholders' best interest. Hope it responds to your question. When, when you look at things like shareholder interests and what the long-term yeah. best outcome is, I, I know, for example, you've had some pretty vocal views about share buybacks, yeah. um, whether these are indeed the best devices for, yeah. um, for return of, um, uh, for shareholder returns. Yeah. Um, would you care to uh, expand on that a bit more? Uh, well, on share buybacks. And uh, on, on any devices in particular that activists push for uh, that may or may not necessarily be in the long-term interests of, of companies? Um, there wasn't, um, I, there is, uh, well, on, on share buybacks we've been very, very vocal for the simple fact that well, what we what sometimes doesn't really pass through is that we do not oppose all share buybacks for the simple fact of share buybacks. We oppose blank check authorities where management asks for uh, the authority to buy back 10% of their share capital for whatever reason may occur in the next year. Uh, that we oppose because it's, it's, uh, there is no clear guarantee link between such an authority and, and shareholder value. Um, in, in, uh, in the past, we've seen... Uh, um, we follow closely, for example, I think um, Mr. Branson's uh, shareholder proposal to a director on Lloyd. We followed very closely. Um, or because we were looking on, on, on whether uh, shareholders' interests were, um, were, were aligned. We also, one that I remember was uh, super dry, not the AGM, but the EGM, where there was a shareholder proposal on firing the CEO and adding some new directors. And I remember that we discussed a lot because basically there was there could have come in a scenario where there were basically two directors on the board, which mm. we, which was basically we couldn't see very much in, in shareholders' best interest because having a board with two directors, with a company like Superdry, um, I mean it, we, I, I think that um, I mean if, if you ask me, of course this is my personal view, but um, of course you always have to look for, so. Um, if I were to look at, at the, the plan or at the proposal from a shareholder activist, I would like them to see that they have a long-term plan for the company, so they care for continuity of the company. They're not proposing something that is too much mandatory on the board, because in the end they are the management and they should be exercising their, their, their uh, um, I wouldn't say discretion, but they have to exercise their, 
um, the powers as well and the prerogatives, um, and that um, this, this other propo these proposals, for example, are not <coughs> driven by yeah, personal contingencies or personal interests, and that actually care for they have a long-term view not just on the company as shareholders, but for the company, so that they care for the company going on and prospering, and not just blowing everything up. Thank you. If I may add a point on the buybacks, uh, which is obviously only one of the tools, or one of the proposals that uh, usually shareholders make to boards, management teams. Um, we have a recent examples in our portfolio of actually a Greek company, one of the largest Greek company. Uh, and this is a company that you know, has a very, uh, very sound, very solid uh, balance sheet. Uh, they have practically zero leverage. Uh, they generate a lot of cash, uh, and, and we, one of the proposals that we made to the board was uh, to uh, start a buyback to take advantage of the very depressed valuation of the stock price. And this is a company whose bonds trades at less than 1% yield to maturity, so they have plenty of access to the credit markets. They recently issued a bond at a very cheap price or very low yields. And at the same time, the stock is trading at you know, high single digits uh, yield. Uh, so because we have assessed and the board agree with us that there were no alternative use of capital, there were no acquisitions to be made, the CapEx plan was coming to an end, uh, we, we, we decided to propose to probably increase the shareholders' remuneration via dividends and buybacks. Uh, we're not a big fan of leverage uh, in general. But obviously, there is middle ground. When you have a company that generates a lot of cash, they have no debt, they are in a, in a sector where they are the dominant player, uh, we, we believe that the best thing they can do with the capital is to return it to shareholders. Uh, because if they don't, they, actively, they, they actually destroy value, especially where their credits is trading at a much tighter yields compared to the equity. So finance one on one tells you that you should buy back your stock if you don't have any better use of your capital. And that's where shareholders uh, can put pressure on the boards, uh, not because of their self-interest, but because they can make a, a, a responsible, sound case that actually to increase shareholders' value for all shareholders, not just for the activists, yeah. the best way to do it is to increase shareholders' remuneration. Philip, um, looking a bit closely, a bit more closely at the domestic market here in Greece, um, how do you think Greek companies are faring in uh, the overall spectrum of, of European governance? Uh, are governance standards markedly different to other regions in Europe? Mm -hmm. And um, does this present uh, new opportunities for activists that are, are looking at the region and, and sizing up Greek companies? I think our aim as uh, as a long-term investor is to protect long-term interests in activist situations and engagements. So we recognize that activist investors can bring significant value and, uh, and promote positive change, especially in situations where in companies where like they're underperforming and they're not responsive to, uh, uh, to shareholder feedback. Um, now, at the same time, we, we acknowledge that there is like, you know, uh, in, inherent tension between long-term investors and short-term investors. Um, we've been seeing, like, our view is like, you know, there needs to be like a transparent debate and we've been uh, kind of seeing like, you know, some, some, some activists that are more short-term focused. Um, I guess some red flags for us even share buybacks that you've mentioned uh, uh, earlier. I guess, like, you know, if there's no better use of capital, of course, like, we would support share buybacks. But there is some evidence in the market that we've been seeing that some companies actually, some, some activists actually are, like, overly focused on financial engineering over, like, capital location. Um, and obviously, we are looking after, like, you know, companies to add value in the long term. So sometimes we may not be supportive of excessive share buybacks and financial engineering, uh, also like, you know, leverage dividends when there is a better use of capital. Um, so th this, is, this is kind of like a, um, a red flag for us. What we've also been seeing is that some boards 
actually like you know in activist situations they settle with uh, with activists before it goes to a proxy contest mm -hmm. and this is sort of like you know for us as uh, as institutional investors it's not always in our, in, in our interest for this to happen uh, we think that you know it's it's not always in the interest of shareholder democracy especially when when some boards they rapidly enter into um, these sort of settlement agreements. Um, so what we ask boards to do in these situations is basically to think twice before entering into a settlement. And we want to see more like, you know, of a true side, should say, between activist investors and, 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 and the boards, rather than an unconditional surrender, I should say. Now, uh, when it comes to like uh, the Greek market, uh, I always say that companies should have like a strong engagement uh, program and the best activist defense is, is actually having a proactive shareholder engagement program. Because ultimately I think that, uh, you know, and I, and, and I guess many companies, they worry about activists. And only the other day I was uh, with, a, with, a, with a chairman of a large UK bank and he was basically like, you know, very worried about like, you know, having activists in, uh, in, uh, in uh, buying in, in, in the company. But I guess like, you know, my answer to that was that, you know, ultimately if you have strong engagement, activists can be as strong as the support they get from other investors. So. Um, One of the things that we've seen by institutional investors is that, you know, they're really pushing for um, that engagement to be done not just at the investor relations level but at the board level and for mm -hmm. investors to be given broad access to the whole board um, mm -hmm. to, to really speak to the remuneration committee, the audit mm -hmm. committee um, and I any of the other uh, subsections of the board. Uh, is that going to gather pace mm -hmm. uh, or it, have we now reached a plateau where everyone accepts that this is how it has to happen. Mm -hmm. We are long-term significant shareholders in many companies. So uh, um, when we engage, we <coughs> expect to have like key decision makers uh, in these engagements so that they can actually drive change and, and be responsive to, to our feedback. So we expect like to have like, uh, uh, for example, an engagement with, uh, with the board chair um, and ultimately, like, you know, for the board to be also able, because we're interested in, in, in strategy and, uh, and for the board to, to actually provide an oversight of strategy. So uh, we want to have persons there that are able to discuss strategy in our engagement. So uh, often, of course, like if it's like an issue where like uh, it has to do with remuneration, again, we would want to discuss like compensation with the right person, which is like the, uh, the chair of the executive compensation committee. Uh, but also at the same time, we expect the chair to be able to discuss compensation and link that to strategy. Mm. But uh, I should say that yes, key decision makers should, should, should do the engagements with, uh, with the investors, with, with the top investors. We have a few minutes for Q&A if the audience has any questions. <coughs> I think you were, I would like to ask you how you see uh, the corporate governance standards in Greece, okay? This is, this is quite important for issuers uh, to know what sort of standards you take mm -hmm. into account, whether it's best international practices or local standards. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Should I take this one? Please. So. Uh, I think that Greece has uh, uh, taken several positive steps in the last few years to improve corporate governance, uh, so which is very, very positive. Um, but still, I should say that uh, um, many companies lag behind European standards. So uh, we've been seeing like, you know, a lack of, uh, of, of independence on boards compared to other like uh, um, European markets. We've been seeing a lack of gender diversity, which is a very important issue for us. Uh, we've been seeing kind of like, you know, I should say more like poor, poor disclosures. 
Um, but on a positive note, like we also see that this is like improving, and we look forward to see like you know seeing more more improvements on uh, on this. If I can step in on, on this question, which is very important to me because I I leave Greek market on a daily basis, and uh, we have experienced a few cases of corporate governance issues. Uh, in general, first of all, let me say that we've been investing in Greece for many years. Uh, and we're still very constructive about your country. We think you know, we are the, uh, the, uh, at the turning point, especially after the recent elections, and agree with what the minister said earlier today. Uh, we think the government uh, has an important role to attract capital to Greece from outside, and corporate governance obviously is a key driver for investors. Uh, our experience with Greek corporates is, I would say, mixed. Uh, on one hand, on the positive side, the boards are more receptive, more sensitive to topics uh, of corporate governance, in particular related to board compositions. Uh, but on the other hand, we think, in our experience, the influence of controlling shareholders, either families or entrepreneurs or strategic holders, uh, is still way too strong. And, and this is an issue for us because minority shareholders need to have the right to uh, have representation on the board. Uh, in our experience, other countries like Italy, Spain have done a lot in this direction. Uh, in Italy, to give an example, you can, as a minority shareholder with 1%, can uh, have the option to propose uh, and elect a representation on the board, a representative on the board as long as obviously your candidate received the votes of the other minority shareholders. Uh, and in our experience, this is something that Greece still lacks. Um, and of course, sh activist shareholders need to demonstrate that their proposals are sound, responsible, and they will create, uh, they're meant to create shareholders uh, value over the long term. Uh, otherwise, you know, it's very difficult. But you know, we think uh, Greece still has a lot of work to do. Uh, we're pleased with some encouraging sign that things are improving. Uh, but when we look at the European um, universe, uh, Greece is still very, very much behind. Uh, we hope that the regulator, uh, the market commissions, uh, continues to monitor the implementation of sound corporate governance um, uh, standards. And we might also suggest a uh, couple of improvements, uh, as I mentioned before. First is the option for minority shareholders to uh, nominate a, an independent candidate on the board or nominate a representative on the board. Uh, and two, uh, around the related party transactions, I think Greece still needs to do a lot more work uh, to make sure that potential conflict of interest are uh, addressed. <laughs> sure. Any other question? Stefano? Always many uh, things. There's been a fantastic panel. I mean, I was the senior panel. We just heard much more of that. Sharing experience, sharing uh, philosophy. And I understand in the talk you were saying that you can do that sort of thing now. I mean, uh, do a little bit more, I guess. Thank you. We listened this morning to, to very interesting speeches, promising speeches. I mean, we will all hope that that will be turned into, into reality no, soon. So no question, but thank you for saying that. Well, if there are no more questions, I'd just like to thank all of the uh, panelists for their, their time and effort and, and indeed their very cogent and interesting views. And um, thank you all for listening. Thank you.